Look at your banners, yeah. We got banners. We got coats in the face. Coats gonna win the game today. But the coats is ready. We got gloves, hats, and coats to keep you warm. Come on, man. I get one of these bands. They only cost one dollar. We have popcorn. <laughs> Get your coke kazoo, get your coke kazoo, right here, your coke kazoo, nice get your coke kazoo. Nice and hot, get him hot here, come on. Get him hot, nice and hot here. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Baltimore Cold Football. This is Chuck Thompson along with Vince Bagley at Memorial Stadium in Baltimore. And this is the Sunday. This is the day that will make or break the Baltimore Colts year. The Cinderella team of the National Football League can win their first championship if they defeat this afternoon the New England Patriots. It will mark perhaps the most brilliant, the most uh, overwhelming kind of a turnaround in the history of the National Football League. And all who are here in the stadium this afternoon are certain of one thing. They're certain that their Baltimore Colts can beat the New England Patriots and become the championship team. Okay, let's mend two things now. Dan, we're physical, and every play's a big play. Victory's ours. Yeah. Yeah. Waiting for Jones to take away. He rolls to his right naked and now looks, fires downfield. Caught by Chester at the 15. Chester to the 5. Chester scores. Looks left, looks right, now Jones runs. Jones to the five, dives, he is in for the touchdown. The Grogan fades back to the five, sets the throw, fires upfield, intercepted! And down the near sideline, Muncy to the five. Muncy is in for the touchdown. Oh, well, this is what it's all about in Baltimore. This is a football team that has stunned the football world with a brilliant, absolutely at times unbelievable, reversal in form from a year ago. And the Baltimore Colts have done what they had to do. They defeated the New England Patriots to win the Eastern Division Championship. We played in a mess. But we've shown enough past the test. <laughs> We're the champs. What do you think, Buster? The Eastern Division Championship is all in the past. But when we arrive in Pittsburgh, we'll be cooking with gas. There's no question there's a lot at stake. But our oven is set to shake and bake. <laughs> all right. OK. We have a lot to be thankful for now. Stan, lead us in prayer. The miracle season of 1975 ended in the playoffs against the world champion Pittsburgh Steelers. In a closely contested game, the Colts pursued an opportunity for an upset victory. But in the end, it was just out of reach. Yet this game was no more than a punctuation mark, a period marking the conclusion of an utterly implausible tale one that ended in the final race to the Super Bowl, but began with a walk down the long, dark corridors of defeat. The fans of the Baltimore Colts were raised on victory, and their old heroes are never forgotten. Gino Marchetti, Art Donovan, Tom Matty, Lenny Moore, men of the 50s and 60s when the Colts were always contenders and frequently champions. 
But in 1974, the Colts were the poorest team in the NFL. And as the 1975 season began, boos and catcalls echoed in a stadium where so brief a time before, only cheers had been heard. By mid-season, the Colts had lost four out of seven games. Almost everyone thought that their season had ended. But general manager Joe Thomas gave not the slightest sign that he shared their view. For Thomas, 1975 represented the completion of a three-year reconstruction program. And as the season moved into the full flush of autumn, the wisdom of his trading and drafting became very apparent. Baltimore's defensive line is a monument to Thomas's uncanny sense of player potential. Mike Barnes, number 63, and Joe Ehrman, number 76, were selected by Thomas in the first two rounds of the 1973 draft. In the 1974 draft, he picked up number 78, John Dutton, and number 72, Fred Cook. In just their second year as a unit, the front four sacked the quarterback more times than any team in the NFL. Through trades, Thomas acquired two starting linebackers, Tom McLeod, number 52, and Jim Chayonsky, who filled in for the injured Mike Curtis. To bolster the defensive backfield, Thomas went to the waiver list and picked up Lloyd Mumford, number 42, and free safety, Jackie Wallace, number 20. Bruce Laird and Nelson Muncy teamed with Mumford and Wallace to intercept 29 passes and return them for more yards and more touchdowns than any team in the NFL. In 1973, when John Unitas was sold to San Diego, the sun finally set on the golden age of Colt football. The same year, however, Joe Thomas drafted a young quarterback from LSU, and by 1975, the same fans who once analyzed the cool precision of Unitas were now amazed by the reckless courage of their new quarterback, Burt Jones. played with pain, with broken ribs, with a sore arm. Hardly a week went by without some mishap. Yet Jones always returned and always provided inspiration. In the same year that Jones arrived, the Colts traded for Raymond Chester, number 87, a rangy tight end who makes a practice of running over defensive backs. Also in 1973, Thomas drafted Bill Olds, number 38, a running back who added scope and depth to the passing attack. Glenn Dowdy, number 35, is the Colts' most talented wide receiver. And as such, he has had to stay alert to survive the feet and fists that often come winging his way. In 
To relieve the pressure on the beleaguered Dowdy, Thomas drafted number 81, Roger Carr, a sprinter with a gift of grab. When defenders became overly concerned with the deep pass to Carr, Dowdy ran shorter routes and used his running ability to gain more yards catching passes than anyone else on the team. When Joe Thomas acquired number 75, all pro offensive tackle George Coons, his rebuilding program was complete. In three years, he had brought in 37 new players. And now, in 1975, the team was ready to rise out of the cellar. To direct the ascent, Thomas and Colt owner Robert Ursay hired Ted Marchabroda as head coach. As a quarterback for the Pittsburgh Steelers in the 1950s, Marchabroda was a man accustomed to hardship and not easily dejected. He extracted energy and encouragement from apparent defeat. And as the first half of the season ended, the seeds of the coming renaissance were evident, not only to Ted Machabroda and Joe Thomas, but to nearly every opponent as well. We knew they were improved. We knew uh, last year, I think most of our guys felt that they may be the uh, most improved team in the uh, conference coming into this year. I know Coach uh, Saban has said it a few times, and we knew they always tough on us. Every time we uh, play them here, we got to get out of here in a hurry, and uh, this year is no exception, and uh, they are definitely a tough football team. All they have to do is win a few, and they'll be gone. After four consecutive losses, the Colts earned victories over New York and Cleveland. And on November 9th, they traveled to Buffalo, seeking their third win in a row. The Bills had the highest scoring team in the NFL and quickly added to their impressive statistics. In the first half, O.J. Simpson rammed three quick scores down Baltimore's throat. But as it turned out, it was just the tonic the Colts needed. With the Bills resting comfortably on a 28-7 lead, and relaxing as though the game were already won, the Colts suddenly exploded and produced the most astounding comeback of the season. Baltimore went on to roll up 35 points, scoring touchdowns from insulting distances. The offensive line with Ken Mendenhall, Elma Collette, Robert Pratt, Ed George, and David Taylor pried open Buffalo's defense, and the Colts outscored the Bills 42 to 35. Out of this inspiring victory came the firm shape of a once shapeless team, a team that had known great discouragement and now swift revival. A young team that had lost just enough of its innocence to reach a sharp fighting edge. Baltimore's victory over the Bills moved them into third place in the Eastern Division. In first place, they would find the Miami Dolphins, four-time winners of the Eastern Crown, a team of confident and relaxed champions, hardened by experiences the young Colts had never had. But on the 10th week, when the two teams met for the first time in the season, it was the old pros of Miami who seemed anxious and confused. Marty Domrez replaced the injured Burt Jones and surprised the Dolphins by the sparing use he made of his passing attack. Baltimore's running game worked so well that Domrez threw only four passes the entire game. Don McCauley, number 23, and Roosevelt Leakes, number 48, dominated the third quarter. And in the fourth quarter, the Colts batted the Dolphins with an 80-yard drive that ended with Lydell Mitchell gliding the last 32 yards for a touchdown. The Colts defeated the Dolphins 33-17 and returned to Baltimore on the wings of a five-game winning streak.
so proud of my whole life to be connected with the Baltimore Colts. Where once grew a string of dreary defeats, the Colts had harvested victories, and a late autumn romance bloomed in Baltimore. Thousands of new fans celebrated the return of winning football with a new battle cry. Shake and bake is what we call putting our opponents in the oven and cooking. And we've had a thing going around for the last four or five weeks since we took fire. And we've been cooking people. And we're just having fun as a group. And we call ourselves the Shake and Bake Squad. Thanksgiving weekend, the Shake and Bake Squad burned the Kansas City Chiefs 28 to 14 as Lydell Mitchell rushed for 178 yards. Baltimore's defense swallowed up the Chiefs like a holiday turkey. Quarterback Len Dawson was sacked seven times and spent most of the afternoon lying in the dirt of Memorial Stadium weighted down with problems that proved finally to be beyond solution. Kansas City was cooked. The Red Hot Colts had their sixth consecutive win and moved into second place, one game behind the Miami Dolphins. You know what we got to do! We got to do it! You know what we got to do! One reason for Baltimore's dramatic rise to the top of the Eastern Division was running back Lydell Mitchell. When injuries cut down Burt Jones's playing time, the team came to depend more than ever on Mitchell's reliable skills. At Penn State, Mitchell earned All-American recognition as a shifty open field runner, but he is deceivingly strong. And close to the goal line, he moves with a determination that is rarely interrupted. Mitchell led the team in scoring, led the AFC in pass receiving, and only O.J. Simpson and Franco Harris gained more yards rushing. Against the New York Giants in the 12th game of the year, Lydell Mitchell became the first running back in Baltimore history to gain more than 1,000 yards in a season. Mitchell's touchdown was the first of three as the Colts trampled the Giants 21 to nothing. Baltimore's defense controlled the game, and linebacker Stan White, number 53, returned an interception for a touchdown. It was the Colts' seventh consecutive victory. And like the fabled little engine that could, they were pulling mightily toward the top of the mountain. At the summit, they would meet the Miami Dolphins, but this time they would be playing in Baltimore with first place in the Eastern Division at stake. A victory over the Dolphins, coupled with a win the final week against the Patriots, would give the Colts the division title and put a crown on the most incredible comeback in NFL history. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dave Humphrey, and this, for the Baltimore Colts, is the biggest game of the year. A classic confrontation between the streaking Colts and Don Shula's Miami Dolphins. This is the game that, in all likelihood, will decide the AFC Eastern Division Championship.
Baltimore's explosive offense was completely muffled by the determined Miami defense. And when Mercury Morris scored the game's only touchdown late in the third quarter, the Dolphins were confident of victory. Kind of a mist is beginning to settle in over Memorial Stadium and is getting a little bit on the cooler side. And Jones takes it away. He wants to throw. Pressure is coming. Rolls right. Sets and fires. Caught by Lydell Mitchell. He's got a first down inside the Miami 40. The takeaway by Burt. No fake. Deep drop. Wants to throw. Dumps it off to Mitchell. Mitchell's got it 35. 30. Down to the 25. And he's inside the Miami 25 and taken down at about the 23. Baltimore is on fire. Pitch out to Mitchell to the right side. Swinging back to the five, to the two, and he is in. 53 seconds to go. What a dramatic moment as the fog really now, Chuck, becoming difficult to see the field as we get into overtime. Baltimore's touchdown really sends the game into sudden death overtime. All right, again, remember now, the first score wins now, man. First score, 110% from everybody now. Damn it, the ball's in the of a guy by the name of Tony Linhart. There it is, spot, kick. It's in the air. I'll wait for the official. He did it! I don't have to tell you. Linhart has won the game. <laughs> the Colt football team are being mobbed by young football fans who have waited and waited and waited. And the Colts have beaten the Dolphins twice this year, which means if they can beat From the last Washington place to first place in a single season, the Baltimore Colts, a team that rewarded football dreamers everywhere. <laughs>